afternoon again. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you're enjoying this thing as much as uh, uh, some of us have been enjoying it over the past six months. Uh, this is the iCampus Student Innovation uh, Prize Program. Uh, I'm Vijay Kumar, one of the uh, from the Office of Educational Innovation and Technology, and uh, along with uh, uh, Hal Abelson and Paul Oka, who are actually the co-conspirators who launched this program when the iCampus initiative uh, uh, concluded. And uh, you know, at any given point in time, I think you can ask Hal to tell you the story of how this program came to be. But it was essentially to see how we could uh, incentivize uh, and support an activity that already goes on in spades at MIT, student-based technological innovation. Uh, you looked at what you're looking at, uh, the five uh, presentations that you're seeing are uh, uh, what have been generated from uh, uh, 14 proposals and uh, 14 projects. And these five have, uh, were selected uh, to come up to this stage. And today we're in a process of judging these five to select uh, one going ahead. Uh, my colleague, Brandon Muramatsu over here, he's been actually running the program, all its dimensions. Uh, uh, putting out the publicity, inviting the presentations, calibrating, handing out these forms. So Brandon, perhaps you can come and tell us about what we need to do going on. Okay, thanks a lot, DJ. And you can introduce the judges to. I'm not sure I know all of their yeah, full names. Okay, that works for me. So um, thank you, VJ. Uh, we have a number of great judges here. We'll, why don't we have the judges introduce themselves first? And so say who you are, what group you're with. Uh, we have a couple of folks from Microsoft here, so. Um, my basic background is supercomputing, so really quickly this kind of stuff, but certainly computers. Uh, I'm Edwin Wyatt, I'm the Senior Academic Developer Evangelist for Higher Ed New England, and I work at NERD, the NERD for Silver Chambers. You, want to, you should get up, Paul. <laughs> my name's Paul Loka, I'm a Research Program Manager with Microsoft Research. Me and Hal have been working together for around uh, five or six years with my campus. Eric. Uh, I'm Eric Hoffer. I'm a professor at Course 11. I run the teacher education program and do research on educational technology. Okay. Oliver. Uh, Oliver Thomas, uh, former MIT student and currently staff in ICT. And Dan. Yeah, Daniel Hastings, I'm a professor in Aero Astro and Engineering Systems and Dean of Undergraduate Education. Okay, great. I got all the judges, right? Yeah, the others of us are ex official. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what we've asked the students to do is prepare a five-minute presentation with about five minutes of Q&A. I told them that we were going to do a random draw to see uh, who goes first, what order. Um, one of the other things to do for everybody, for all the students certainly, is we've got some video release forms. We'd like to make sure that we get your permission to use the, the video and the photos that we've been shooting. And the photographer, Jeff, who works in our office, OEIT, um, has them at the back. He'll be passing them out. Did I get everything? We can do them for everybody. That way we're covered. OK. So the question is, who gets to draw these? I guess we'll make Hal do it. Go <laughs> <laughs> get some fresh now. Hal. OK. Planner. OK, so Planner will go first. Let's have, let's have Hal pick the next set. Books or? Planner. <laughs> <laughs> okay, book, book X or? Yep, and then after them? Okay, crowd skimmer. Crowd third. skimmer will go third. Okay, PSET Central. PSET Central is fourth. And, and I don't have to draw the last one. There, there, there's, there's okay. anticipation. Book picker. OK, great. Thanks, Hal. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Adin Shmoman. I'm a, a sophomore in electrical engineering and computer science. And I'm here to talk to you guys about Planner. Um, Planner is a tool that's meant to uh, help students uh, choose their classes and make their schedules and sort of just, you know, 
organize their time uh, in a way that's you know very easy and flexible and just doesn't take very much of their time at all. Um, and this came this came about you know mainly through personal experience and trying to use some of the other tools that are around MIT, um, like Picker, which, which also came through iCampus a number of years ago. Uh, and, and the main issue is that with so many, with so many variables and so many things um, changing, like different, you know, you can have different recitations at different times, uh, there's, there's too much information for a person to really process. Uh, you can end up with, you know, a number of freshman classes getting like 900 schedules that don't have any conflicts. And you don't even know that you, you know, and you're still having to sort through the ones that do have conflicts. So how are you gonna do this? Uh, so the answer that, you know, me and, and my team came up with was, I don't know, just ask. Um, ask. Ask the user for, you know, their preferences. How is it that they would like their days to be sorted? Do they want their days to start late? I would. Um, you know, do they, are they, are they somebody who likes their classes to start early and, you know, and end early so they can go and you know, you're up until all hours of the morning? Uh, these, these are the kinds of questions that we tried to answer, and I think you know, we did pretty well. Um, this, was, this was implemented uh, using uh, ASP.NET, uh, running, uh, you know, which is uh, running on Microsoft's um, .NET framework. Uh, well, sort of. It's actually running in the open source version Mono, uh, running on some Linux server or virtual virtual machine run by uh, MIT's Student Information Processing Board. Uh, so lots of lots of MIT technologies and interesting things running around making this happen. Uh, and then you know just lots of JavaScript to make all make all the all the pretty things and you know make the users feel like they actually understand what's happening. Um, the the main the, you know some of the main use cases of of planner are you know having a student who wants to take you know he's not really sure necessarily what classes he wants to take uh, maybe he knows he wants to take you know six you know um, he wants to take you know circuitry and differential equations and uh, you know multivariable calculus and creating video games cool class that I'm in now. Uh, and just kind of wants to make it happen. And maybe he's not sure if he wants to take multivariable calculus, the regular one or the advanced one. He just wants to have a schedule that works. So you can input all of these things into, pl into Planner, along with you know, maybe his, his sailing schedule or you know, crew and the fact that he likes to have lunch with his dad on Wednesdays at you know, noon. And all of these, th all of these factors will just, get so will just get sorted out for you so that you have to look through at most like 10 schedules with minor differences, and all of a sudden you have your answer. It's just that easy. Uh, all right, thanks. Any questions? Thank you. Any questions? Uh, so is there any sense to which it actually optimizes anything? Uh, is there, some, I mean, is there it, some objective function you give it to optimize? Uh, so we played around with using uh, objective functions and heuristics. All right. uh, we settled on heuristics mainly because uh, they're easier to tweak after talking to users. Um, and it's not necessarily the case that you, you want like every class, uh, you, know, and you want to give like a, a total order and say, I want all of my classes to be so sorted first by you know, how, uh, how late they start, and then by how early they end, and then by how clustered they are, you know, and then by whether I have lunch or not, you know, uh, or how much time I have for lunch. Uh, sometimes you just want, sometimes it's sort of a mix of the things and not necessarily an order. Uh, and if you have a mix, you can't, it's, it's hard to do that algorithmically. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's, it just kind of came out nicer to do it with the heuristic. So, so, so that's why you generate a whole set of them. No, the, the whole uh, set is generated because there are so, there's, the set is the number of possible schedules that can exist, um, which, you know, without any kinds of conflicts, which, you know, if you've got 10 different recitation times that you need to choose one of, yeah, yeah. Right. there's automatically large numbers of them. Uh, the sorting is what's done heuristically and what allows it so that instead of 
looking at 100 or 200 or 900 schedules, you're looking probably at the first 10. Yeah. OK. Any more questions? So uh, have you seen anything? Have you seen anything in the market, in industry, any product that uh, provides this kind of functionality? Uh, there is one uh, thing, it's called Schedulizer, um, which provides um, some, it provides some of the uh, uh, functionality in terms of making sure that there's no uh, conflicts or giving you options such that there uh, are no conflicts, hopefully. Uh, it does some uh, sorting. Uh, I'm not sure if they do it algorithmically or with a heuristic. Uh, there aren't that many. There aren't that many preferences to choose from, and the way they display the data is a little strange. They kind of give you all of the schedules at once, uh, and if there's more than six of them, then you get that kind of like Google Next Page feel, where oh, there's six. All right, I give up. Like, all right, I'll just choose one of these. Like, it doesn't really matter. Uh, they're not really sorted or opti like there. There's no sorted order. So if you end up with like twelve schedules, like, oh well, I guess you'll just look at six of them. Um, that's that's at least what I saw when going around hunting for ideas and seeing what was out there. Bookstore. All right. Hi, everybody. My name is Peter, and this is the rest of the team, Ilya, uh, Calvin, and Erica. And we worked on a project called Bookstore, and it's a learning management system along the lines of Stellar, Blackboard, or Moodle. And basically, we saw a lot of problems in those systems, and we wanted to improve them so that teachers could get more out of them and students could get more out of them as well. So, next slide. Cool. Okay, so one of the problems with Stellar, Blackboard, and Moodle is that they really don't provide very much information to the teachers about what students are actually doing. Um, so, for example, they have no idea whether the students read chapter one or chapter two, or whether they even looked at the P set, right, until the next time the test is taken, which might be a month or might be the end of the semester when they have some sort of evaluation about how the class actually went, right? Uh, another problem is that they have pretty bad workflow. So if you want to ask a question and you're reading through the course materials, you have to go out three levels, click on the forum, post a topic, and type in your question. And no one is ever going to see that question again, probably, unless the teacher specifically says, go look at the forum, right? And so we, what we wanted to do was uh, improve this workflow so that you ask and respond to questions in the flow of actually learning. So the first thing that we provided for the teachers is usage, an usage analytics about what the students are actually reading. So it's down to tenth of a page resolution, uh, second by second. What were the students reading on each page, and why were they actually learning it? So uh, when the student logs in, they see sort of a list of possible things that they could be doing, whether it's reading for a lab, or homework prep, lecture prep, exam prep, stuff like that. So we can actually generate a plot for the professor of what was being read on each document for what purpose. And they can also see which documents in their class were used for which purpose. And this gives the teacher a lot of feedback that might help them understand that you know, on page 20 was never read by any of the students. Uh, and so maybe they should mention that in lecture. And maybe it's like a big problem. Maybe that's going to be on the test. Right? Um, and the second problem was the dis discussion, the communication tools. And so what we actually did is allowed students and professors to have a discussion in the margins, where you could have a thread specifically tied to one paragraph, or a figure, or something like that. And uh, it's sort of integrated into the workflow, because as you're reading, you have a question. You just click on the margin, type in your question, and professors and other students can get notifications that the question has been posted, that you might know the answer. Um, and so a discussion ensues actually on the document. I go for it. So this is sort of a, a live view of the analytics. This is sort of by page number. Uh, and this is the average time spent on that page. And as you can see, students read you know, the first page, the 22nd page, and the 44th page, and not much in between. And that could be really valuable information for a professor uh, if they actually want to make sure that their students understand the material. Um, go ahead. And this is the actual viewer where the students need to view the document in order for us to collect the analytics and host the discussion. So uh, this is, we have live chat which allows students to chat with the TA or the professor or just other students in the class. And then uh, over here, we have the discussion in the margins. So you, this, you just click on this bubble, and you can see a discussion slide out. And you can 
talk to the TAs or whatever. And just sort of as you're scrolling through, you see these discussions that are fundamentally tied to these paragraphs or diagrams. So yeah, thank you. Uh, we have a lot more work to do. Uh, we've been getting feedback from professors and uh, some students. And so we're working to fix all the problems that have come up. You have any questions? Questions? Okay, go ahead. You're getting uh, feedback from professors. So, um, one of the challenges might be it's okay. I don't want all that data. <laughs> <laughs> Could That's you repeat the question, yeah. please. I think so, the question. Repeat the question. Oh, sure. So, the question is uh, professors might say, you know, I don't want all this data. So, so what? So what what, what's your feedback been so far, and how might you sort of think about distilling that to sort of the most useful information? Sure. So what we've heard so far isn't, I don't want data. It's that they might not know what to do with the data. Uh, the data is sort of inherently valuable. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's a great point. What we're trying to do is actually distill it into some sort of actionable item. So for example, uh, we can tell that if you've been reading through, the, a student has been reading through the document and they got to page 10 and all of a sudden their reading pace slowed to like, you know, half the pace, we can sort of notify the professor, look, the student may be stuck. You know, click here to help them and it just pops open a chat window and you can start a discussion. Okay, um, let's say I'm more, I can't read on screens for some reason, just I can't, so I print it out on documents, so that kind of hinders with your process of like understanding whether, how I read. So how do you deal with such things like that? Uh, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> if, if, if you want to download the PDF, we let you download the PDF. Uh, we're, we're not trying to lock you in. Um, but you're right, we can't collect data on that. And then you're sort of stuck in the old system, uh, which is, the, we'll just have less data. But I think a lot of people do read online, um, and it's certainly a growing number. So it's a concern that I think will slowly disappear. Any more questions? Do you have any numbers to support that? Um, not specifically off the top of my head. <laughs> it's growing 10% per year. <laughs> well, there's a lot of different readers out there today, right? So I right. use the Kindle. <coughs> I think the reading format, uh, everybody reading on a laptop or a computer screen, yeah, sure. So this isn't fundamentally tied to a laptop or a computer screen. Not, nothing is flash-based, so it's not limited. You know, it's not stuck on non-Apple products or anything like that. You could look, pull this up on your iPad if you wanted. Yeah. So I think one challenge with reading online for an application like this in particular is that there are a lot of other things you could also be doing on your computer while you're reading through sure. course materials. Have you thought about that? Is there a pause button or? What, what do you mean by pause button? Uh, can I say I'm going to pop over the Facebook now, don't count that as time that oh, I'm not reading. Sure, sure. Text. So actually, it's, it's, there's a pretty marked difference between uh, actually reading a document and sort of you've got left the page. It turns out if you're actually reading a document, you pretty much move the, the, the bar, you scroll up and down at least once every couple seconds, even if you're like really locked in reading. Um, and if you go away to Facebook, you know, that's like two minutes. So, so you're it's, it's huge outliers, and we just throw it out. Yeah. Great. And I guess one of the things that we try to do with this reader is I provide real tools for the students so that it becomes better than just a PDF, because uh, PDF is really just a digital representation of the paper product. And so we, we want to provide tools that actually make them want to use it in the browser, uh, such as chat and discussion on the margins. No, actually, one quick follow-up. Uh, you said that downloading PDFs and printing is perfectly fine. Do you actually monitor that so that the faculty member gets some feedback on who reads online versus not? Yes, we will. We don't have the awesome. downloading up, but yes. One last question. So uh, are there any scaling issues for this? Uh, in terms of like the actual technology? No, I mean, classes of 10 are fine, classes of 600 are not. Uh, um, certainly, if you have a class of 600, the things could become sort of um, crowded on the page. Um, so yeah, that's sort of a UI issue that we're, that we're looking at in terms of like the actual data collection or like yeah, the I just wondered if you number of connections. Have you attempted to scale it? Uh, oh yeah, yes. Yeah, and actually we're sort of in the process of moving towards uh, more scalable architectures uh, like Nginx and, and uh, HAProxy, which will allow us to sort of create more of a server cluster than the sort of current server configuration that we have right now.
Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Crowd skimmer. Hello, my name is Connie Chan. I'm a junior at MIT studying course six computer science. So, uh, so I created Crowd Skimmer, and it's basically a crowdsourcing application that runs only in Google Chrome, and it's just a browser extension. And the idea is that it helps students um, be able to read and skim through t long technical papers more quickly. So the inspiration behind this idea, uh, I can click. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so the inspiration is uh, came from one of the classes I'm taking this semester. Um, it's a course six class that's a communication intensive class. So we end up having to read at least two papers every week, and they're usually they range from 10 to 30 pages long, and it's pretty painful to read the entire thing. So we're actually expected to be able to skim through all the papers, but not everyone is very good at skimming, and not everyone wants to put in that much time into reading these papers, unfortunately. Yeah, so. Um, <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, so since everyone, since the classes you're taking, some, well, at least my class, it's about 200 people. Some classes are smaller. Um, it's not really relevant, but um, since all, all, a bunch of other people have to do the exact same thing that you do, I thought, why not just combine everyone's efforts um, into um, just processing these papers? And, and whenever, when people read, they usually like highlight things that are important or like circle important things. So, uh, so yeah, I just combined all of that onto an online application. So, um, yeah, I'll just give a scenario of how this would work. So, uh, next slide. So this is pretty common. This is one of the papers I actually had to read this semester. So it's a lot of text, it's very daunting. Um, and so what I created was, um, so like, next slide. Yeah, so uh, instead of just having to look at that, like, PDF, uh, you can, uh, so the, Oh, well, it's cut off the top, but uh, you can't really see it. And it's kind of important, but uh, yeah. So uh, the application I created um, basically takes the PDF and puts it in a viewer, and then allows you to uh, allows anyone on the internet because it's completely anonymous. It's open to everyone in the world uh, to highlight what they like the important phrases and also uh, type in what keywords they think. Um, what other keywords there are, or like key ideas, and uh, yeah, so other people look at the same thing, and they might think a different topic is more important, or a different sentence is more important, so they also highlight the same thing, and uh, yeah, so everyone just goes through doing this, and uh, they end up learning more quickly, and being able to understand what papers are talking about, and um, yeah, another thing you could do with this, if, uh, if you're doing research in a certain area and you want to find other documents that have uh, the same keyword, then you just click on the keyword up there and then it will pull up other papers that have that same keyword. And uh, yeah, so that's how typical user, how I envision a typical user would use this product. And, um, and also a lot of people are concerned with, well, what if, what if there are some people who are malicious and just highlight everything in the document? And the product's not useful anymore. Uh, so in response to that, uh, there's like a feedback system where if you click on whatever you highlighted or the keyword, and then you can you have the option of marking it as wrong. So if enough people mark it as wrong, then it's probably wrong, and then that can be taken out. So that's uh, where quality control comes in. Um, so for implementation, next slide. Uh, so it's this is all uh, since it's a browser extension, it's all HTML, CSS, JavaScript, or jQuery. Uh, for the front end, whatever you just saw. And then in the back end, there's a MySQL database that's storing all this information, and I use PHP to, um, for the front end to communicate to the back end. So, um, yeah, that's, I think I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> I saw Vijay's hand go up. No, I wanted to ask you this then, I forgot. So the database that's getting updated, you know, yeah. the, the, the crowd goes and says, you know, this is wrong, right? Yeah. Database gets updated. Is that irreversible? What happens if subsequently a whole bunch of people say there's something missing over here? What, what do you I mean? I mean, it's a document, I mean, I was thinking about Wikipedia. Yeah. Wikipedia is continuously up, right. know, uh, uh, updated. Uh -huh. You take stuff out, you put stuff in. Okay. And uh, I was thinking, well, I mean, 
It's trying to understand how this thing continuously updates the shared document. That was my first. Um, so when you highlight something, then it'll just. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can. Well, if it, okay, there we go. Um, so this is a typical document um, up here. Oh, sorry. Um, well, the top bar is supposed to look better, but I guess it's shifted, but. Uh, okay, there we go. So uh, this button pulls down the toolbar. Uh, there's a problem with screen resolution. Oh, okay, anyways. Um, yeah, so you can just select what you think is important, and then when you click this button, it sends that information to the database, and then next time the page loads, it gets updated the same way. The keywords are the same, uh, and that's how you mark things as irrelevant. And uh, yeah, so I'm not sure if that answered your question. So they just get lighter when they become less relevant, and darker as they become more relevant, or? Uh, yeah, it gets lighter when you Say it's wrong. So, Until yeah. it goes away. Yeah. <laughs> Is there a way to see what you've highlighted? Uh, not right now because there it's not I'm not tracking any users. So um, but I mean in the future it could be, but right now it doesn't have that functionality. Yeah. One more. Uh, just repeat the question. A design choice or just a, a design limitation or a technical limitation. I mean, it seems like it's great to get everybody in there, but in fact, maybe you might get extraneous information as you saw, or the fact that if somehow I was tagged as like a student reading this, I might get a different, and, and a researcher might find totally different parts of this relevant. And so having some identity within the system might actually be important. So yeah, have, yeah, I mean, I've thought about it. It's just for like this stage, uh, yeah. I didn't do user accounts, so. And I mainly wanted to see what actual users thought like user accounts should be divided into because there's a lot of different ways you can create accounts. So I wanted to see what other users thought first. Okay, any more questions? If not, thank you very much. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel and uh, these are my teammates, Erica, Catherine, uh, uh, Stephanie and Victor. And together, we are the PSET Central team. PSET Central is an online study group management interface designed for MIT students that, unlike texting, emails, and forums, provides MIT students with an integrated, centralized, campus-wide approach for finding, creating, and organizing study groups. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, back one. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let me introduce you to Caitlin. Uh, Caitlin's working on a piece set. It's 2 a.m. in the morning. She's completely stuck on working on this physics piece set. In addition to this problem, um, the weather outside is just awful. She's not going to be able to go out to work with her usual friends. So who can she work with? So using piece at Central, going onto our website, she could really quickly find other people in her dorm who are also working on that piece set, and then together they could work on this piece set. And by collaborating, they will not only finish the piece set faster, but they'll also learn the material better. You might be asking, how exactly did Caitlin find her study groups? Well, upon entering piece set central, Caitlin can immediately go to, um, go to the join a group uh, tab, and a list of all the current groups will be displayed. From there, Caitlin can go through the groups by class, location, and time. <clears throat> um, in the case that Caitlin could not find a group that fit her need, to fit her needs, she could very easily and quickly create her own group uh, by filling out a simple form. Uh, 
Um, <clears throat> so in this scenario, Caitlin joined uh, an in-person group. PSAT Central also supports uh, two different types of uh, study groups, uh, both of which are online. Uh, the first one is uh, via chat rooms, and the second one is via an online whiteboard. So uh, Caitlin can keep track of her groups using our four-way real-time notification system, which integrates texting, emailing, Facebook, and also we have our own internal notification system. Um, the system, in, in this system, you can customize your settings, so you only have select updates. For example, uh, Caitlin can say, oh, I want a text message about an hour before this group is going to meet. On other way, it's a dual way system, she could text the website a certain preset chain of words, and in return, she can get crucial information about her groups. And another thing she could do is she could um, invite other friends to her group via Facebook and via email. So the system architecture is in three sections. There's um, the site itself, it's on scripts.mit.edu, and it interacts with the server to store the group data as well as retrieve the group data. And the website also um, communicates with its members via email, Facebook, and texting. We have no doubt that once implemented into the MIT community, PSET Central will change the way that, M that MIT students study and <clears throat> interact with one another. <clears throat> sorry, sorry, a little nervous. <laughs> um, in the future, um, we would like Peace at Central to be well integrated into the MIT community. Um, and part of this integration, we would believe that well, when involved, uh, teachers will also be able to hold online study groups from the comfort of their own homes. Um, in the future, we also we would also, after this, like to work with ISNT to unveil PSET Central as a campus-wide uh, site and also uh, extend PSET Central into other academic institutions. Um, on behalf of the PSET Central team, like, we thank you for your time and we will not take any questions that you may have. Questions? So my general experience is that uh, off, especially in like late night scenario, peace setting is very kind of ad hoc and kind of happens spontaneously and all the time. Um, have you done any testing whether people actually will take the time to inform people that they don't know that they're about to start their peace set? Um, our website hasn't gone um, public yet, uh, but based on our um, like asking our own friends and and like that, um, we've figured that. At that point, if you really don't know, you going online and you can create your group. So maybe someone else is looking for it. If they're too shy or too nervous to create their own group, they can look for them. Or other people would be like really desperate and like, I'm going to put myself out there. And since it's all in one place, everyone will see it. And hopefully someone will be there to help. Have you thought about issues in uh, privacy and security? So if you're having people sort of try to meet each other and they don't know who they are and how they create accounts and how they verify that information? Um, well, we have our website. It goes through MIT certificates. Um, that's, I guess, one block. So you are guaranteed it's someone from the MIT community um, that you will be working with. Um, I personally feel that I feel very safe on campus, so I think that would work well. Um, other than that, we do have, um, you were saying privacy issues? Yeah. Um, I think, I think certificates address certificates that as well. Certificates is probably like the main thing we have out there for it. The fact that member or student and not an affiliate. Mm -hmm. I think right now we're trying to make it so it's, for, it's targeting the students, so hopefully it will be all students. Do you have any sense of how many people will actually physically get together and how many people will uh, get together electronically? Um, well, 
I think what we would, we, what our vision is that because we have a host system, um, so the groups will only be a certain size uh, based on the preferences of the host. Um, you also can, sorry, I kind of forgot the second part of your question. So uh, I, I understand that you can find a group of people mm -hmm. and literally sit around a table. Yeah. Or you can form a group and chat, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I'm just wondering if you have any notion of how often it will be one mode versus the other? Um, I think MIT students tend to meet in groups, but there is always the case of what you can't, what if you can't physically be together. And I think majority will be in-person groups, but the, there is that other option, and that's what I think makes our site somewhat special. Are you in any way addressing kind of where people are in an assignment? Because just to work on the same assignment as you doesn't necessarily mean that we're kind of a good match to work together, right? Is there any sort of these people are good matches based on kind of where they're in the material or anything else? So are you saying like let's say I have a five page, uh, I mean a five question problem set and I'm on one and someone else is on three? Right. And so imagine we're on different parts of the P set mm -hmm. and we have different learning styles, not necessarily actually should be working together, right? It's not, it might come and hinder your efforts instead of helping you out. I think that our website isn't, it's, we're helping that the formation of the group, whether it works or not, is something we can't really control. And hopefully they will try again in another group or find other ways to work with it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I want to talk to you today about Books Picker. Books Picker was made by me, Jonathan Goldberg, and Rodrigo Pense. Uh, of course. <laughs> so it was, it was made by the three of us, uh, as depicted here as pirates. Uh, the trick between behind the pirate theme of our website is that our main goal was to free up this uh, textbook information monopoly that exists at MIT. Uh, before Books Picker came along, the landscape was that if a student wants to figure out what books they need, they either have to wait until the professor tells them during the lecture that, oh, you need this book, or you go to the coop and try to buy it there. At the end of the day, this ends up costing you a few hundred extra dollars, and we wanted to change this. And so we, uh, we made Books Picker. Books Picker has quite a few features by now, and um, I guess essentially the first, tackle, first, first issue we tackled was this textbook information issue. We went around, we, saw, we tried asking people, why is the situation like this? Why is the coop the only people who has this textbook information? Sure, the libraries have some information like course reserves and whatnot, but at the end of the day, I can't really go and ask the library for this class which books are required. And so we made this thing called Books Picker. Um, and essentially, it has a few main features. You can get on this website. You can find out which books you need for what classes. And then it'll tell you what um, are the best prices for these books, whether it's online from a reseller like Amazon or eBay, whether it's locally from another student, or from the bookstore. We're trying to get you the best books at the best prices. And so those are the first set of features. And then we built a local marketplace on top of that so that we could really get student offers into our database. And on top of that, really give a set of really cool features that students can use to buy textbooks. So Rodrigo Pince actually worked on his thesis um, on this topic. And uh, we came out with some really cool features from that. So some of the features include social prioritization. So here, if you were going to find a student offer on this textbook, then you would actually, uh, the system would actually check whether or not the student who's selling their book is actually close to you on the, or your social graph based on Facebook data that we gather. And so if you are, then it means that, oh, it seems that you'd rather buy this textbook from a Facebook friend than a random reseller like Alibris or some random student reseller. Uh, there's this feature. There's also the feature of um, automatic pricing, which essentially lets you uh, take out randomness from the equation. Right now, in a lot of different local marketplaces, even Craigslist, you're going to get yet some kind of product, such as a table, which uh, maybe there are five different tables that look exactly the same, but the prices range rarely, or they are the same. And so our question was, why is this the case? We need better prices, and the prices should be based on the market that's there right now. And so 
we made automatic pricing, which lets you uh, choose this option. And when a student comes to buy your book, the price they see is based on local market conditions rather than some predetermined price that you set before. And so with these cool features, we've um, really given the students the ability to find out which books they need from before and buy their books at the cheapest price. And uh, we've recently expanded to three different schools, uh, or four now. So um, now we've also launched at Dartmouth, uh, University of Chicago, and Northwestern. And so we've really tried to spread the solution out to uh, as many people as we can and really give them the opportunity to free themselves from this monopoly. Uh, so I'm just going to go through a really quick demo. Um, so ah, that's the duck. <laughs> so <laughs> of course. So I want to tell you a really quick story about Lucy and her books picker story. <laughs> so she comes on the website. She picks which school she's from. She's from MIT. She selects MIT. She gets on the customized version of Books Picker that's meant for MIT. It has all of MIT's courses, which books it needs, whatnots. Um, she searches 6006, because she's taking that class next semester, and she wants to get the book right before her class starts. Uh, she selects it. She gets onto the search page. Uh, now she can see that, all right, this book requires these classes. And it also shows whether it's required, whether it's recommended. This book is actually required. and so. She picks it, and then she remembers that she wants to buy a Harry Potter book. <laughs> uh, she just finished reading the previous one, so she's going to buy the next one. She adds that in as well. And she, then she clicks, finds the find the best prices. Uh, that shows her which prices are the best based on online, local, and the local textbooks information. And she just ended up saving $66, <laughs> which is awesome. Uh, and then she remembers that she also wants to sell the old book she just finished reading of Harry Potter. So she clicks sell, um, enters in the ISBN number, selects automatic pricing, and submits her, um, her book onto our local marketplace. So, uh, oh, and really quickly, I think I'm out of time. Uh, okay. <laughs> Implementation, just a really quick glance. Um, it's, it's an exciting uh, implementation because we use the Google Web Toolkit. It allows our website to really be extremely responsive, just like you would feel on a desktop application. Uh, we're, be, we're able to do a lot of prefetching. Everything's JavaScript-based. And at the end of the day, you, uh, you have this infrastructure here, where for offer searches, we go through our database. We ask Amazon, Alibris, A Books, what's the best prices? Then for the social prioritization, we ask Facebook about, um, like, the data itself, like the social okay. graph data. I'm going to have to cut you off. Okay, now. No Thanks. Thank a lot. you. Thank you. <laughs> questions. Come back up for questions. Any questions? What's the interaction between this and this textbook information project? So, um, uh, when we started, the textbook information project was not um, in existence yet. Um, and it really helped us out in the end. So when we started, we talked to the ISMT, the libraries, a lot of different people. And basically, we saw that there was very little information available to MIT. And then this, um, the Higher Education Act came along. And then the TIP project uh, came into existence. And so right now, the TIP project, and uh, I firmly believe like the work Bookswicker has done, has enabled uh, students to right now go on WebSys and see that, all right, for this book, for this class, we need these books. But still, like, the information is not complete. And um, it's, still, it's still, I think in the TIP, it's getting there. But right now, I, I'd say Books Picker and the Coop are the only places you get a comprehensive set of um, a books, a book information, essentially. So. Okay, I'm going to go to Paul next, since I saw his hand there. Um, how are you handling the exchange of currency for the books? If I'm a d selling to you know someone I know or versus uh, a, a retailer like Amazon, so you you can't uh, sell to online resellers. It's only local. So you're when you're when you put your book onto the marketplace, it's only to other students that you're selling. Sorry, I think the question was, do you do I put my credit card information to your site and you send money to Amazon then? Or do you send me to Amazon to buy it directly from Amazon? Ah, yeah, yeah. So I, I send you to Amazon. So uh, when you click uh, buy selected offers, it's uh, it send, it's open up new tabs where like Amazon 
has its cart filled with the book you chose and whatnot. I, I noticed that all your schools are pretty big schools. Have uh -huh. you at all been approached or approached any small schools that might have might not have their own bookstore? Uh, no, actually. <laughs> right now, it's uh, like we we've just focused on getting the technology right and then spreading to um, I guess the first three schools we could, which had a trimester system. So they were starting in March. That's why we chose those three schools. <laughs>